morning's gospel comes from John, the first chapter, which we had read through the Christmas season, the story of Jesus coming into the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is what happens after those verses. It begins at verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he explained, exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are, be, you are to be called Kephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you have ever received a postcard in the mail that said, you have won a trip, a cruise to the Bahamas, all expenses paid, all the food you can eat, first class accommodations. What did you do with that card? What? You threw it in the trash, but it was a trip. It was a free trip, a luxurious trip, right? What made you throw it away? Afraid of the catch 22. What? Afraid of the catch 22. Afraid of the catch 22? What do you mean? They're going to want something in return. They're going to want something in return. How many of you have received such a card in the mail? How many of you have thrown it away? Wow, doubters. <laughs> now, what would you do if I called you up and said, I got this card in the mail? that said, you have won a trip to the Bahamas, all expenses paid, and you said, I got that card too, I threw mine away. What if I said to you, I didn't throw mine away, and I went, and it was fabulous. It was just as they promised. There was no strings attached. I didn't have to buy a timeshare. I didn't have to sign up for anything. I went, and I had the best time of my life. What would you be doing then? You would be going through that trash can looking for that card, right? What is it that makes you believe something and not something else? I'm hoping you would believe me. Some of you haven't known me that long and probably thought, well, maybe if Bill called me, I'd believe that. <laughs> but don't you believe what you hear from someone who you know and you trust, who has seen it for him or herself? Don't you know then that this is a word that you can be sure of? And wouldn't you be more likely to act on that than something you just received in the mail that seemed like a scam or an advertisement or a way to sell you yet another something that you don't need. Sort of what happens in the story today, isn't it? Because you've got to remember that these are folks who are looking for the Messiah. And look at the passage that we read from Isaiah this morning, something that is called the Song of the Servant, those passages after the people have gone into exile after God has restored the promise to them, but before they've been restored to the land. And they're told about a servant. And some folks think the servant is Israel itself. But there seems to be the possibility that it's someone, a person. And from our perspective as the people of God in Jesus Christ, we understand that servant to be Jesus himself, who is coming into the world. 
So you have to understand that when they were standing around with John that day, and when they said there were two disciples, they weren't Jesus' disciples, yet they hadn't met him. They were disciples of John, people who followed John because of his compelling message and his compelling presence out there baptizing in the Jordan River, looking a little crazy, eating bugs and honey and dressed in animal skins and proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand and it was time to repent and get with the program. But what was John always clear to say? I am not the one you're waiting for. It's not me. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And today this happens after that scene where Jesus has been baptized. John sees him coming and says, this is the one that God told me about. God said that when my Messiah comes, you'll recognize him because the heavens are going to open and my spirit's going to descend upon him like a dove and touch him, and we will know it's him. But the others hadn't seen this. And so they're following John, thinking maybe he really doesn't know, but he is the one. He's got to be the one. Who could be this outrageous without being from God? And then they're standing there with John, and Jesus walks by, and what does he say? There he is, the Lamb of God. In this version, not what we are used to. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There he is. He's the one. And what do they do with that information? They go and they tell. Jesus says to them, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Interesting question, isn't it? Because he knows what people are looking for. He knows that they're looking for the meaning of their relationship with God. He knows they're looking for the Messiah, but he wants to know from them. And they want to go with him. They want to see where he's staying. They want to spend some time in his presence. And when they see and they listen, they believe. And that is when Andrew goes and tells his more famous brother, Peter. What do you know about Andrew from scripture? Well, let me ask you this, what do you know about Peter? Give me some of the highlights of Peter's life. Denier. Denier. Not his best moment. Pentecost. Peter preaches a sermon and everybody looks at him and says, wow, I can't believe that guy's just a fisherman. He speaks with authority and passion. What else do you know about Peter? Hmm? He took a step on the water, and then he said, whoa, I can't do this. I invite you all to stop in my office and see I have a beautiful painting called The Hand of God, which speaks to my life because it's Peter looking up at the, through the water. You don't see Peter, but you see Jesus reaching toward him. That's how I feel a lot of the days that I'm in ministry. What else do you know about Peter? He was crucified. Tradition says upside down because he didn't consider himself worthy enough to be crucified like God as Savior. Peter, the one who is invited to the transfiguration. We'll read that story in a few weeks. Peter, the one who sort of blunders through a lot of things. But Peter is the rock that Jesus is going to build his kingdom on. But guess what, people? There wouldn't have been a Peter if Andrew hadn't told him what he saw. You know how Western people sometimes talk about reincarnation? I'm not talking about religious traditions that teach reincarnation. But if somebody has been reincarnated, what they're going to be reincarnated as? Nobody's ever reincarnated as the guy who put shoes on horses or scooped out the latrine, right? It's Cleopatra. I was Cleopatra in a former life. Or I was Napoleon. Nobody's ever just some average Joe but it's the average Joes of the world and the average Janes of the world that tell the story in compelling ways. If not for John saying, this is the one that God revealed to me, if not for Andrew listening to John, if not for Andrew listening to John and going to Jesus and speaking with him and then going to his Peter saying, we have found the Messiah, the rock upon which Christ built his church would never have known. We are all here today because somebody thought enough of us to tell us the story of Jesus Christ and his love. We are all here because somebody thought enough about us and our future, not just our eternal future, but our daily lives to bring us to church, to lead us to God. Some of you are here because your mom and dad put you in the car this morning. But there's going to be a point in your life when you come because you have learned that this is truly the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world and that you have been called to be a light to the nations because if you're not going to tell people, they are never 
going to hear the story. We are living in an age where the majority of people under the age of 40 have never been inside a church. Why is that? Because nobody ever invited them in a meaningful way. Now, I don't think evangelism is what some folks have made it out to be, where you go up and you ring somebody's doorbell and knock on their door and they open the door and they say, do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? Have you ever had that happen to you? I had that happen to me so many times when I lived in West Virginia because people knew I was the pastor of the Methodist church. So I had all kinds of people trying to save me from Methodism and being a woman pastor. But what does it say to someone to knock on their door and say, do you know what's going to happen to you after you die? What it really says is, you're going to hell, buddy boy, and I know it. It is not an invitation to grace. It is not an invitation to new life. It is not an invitation to the power and the presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that fills you and changes you and uses you in the world to tell the story. It doesn't make you a light to the nation. It makes you a party pooper in the biggest way. If all you can say to someone is, get yourself saved. But you know, the best definition of evangelization I ever heard was, was a statement made by a pastor in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka, who was the head of the Methodist church there. And he said, evangelization is one beggar telling another where to find bread. It was my honor and privilege this past week to meet with the leaders of our AA groups here at Epworth Church. I have often said the best churches I have ever visited, and I mean this in all sincerity, the best churches I have ever visited are AA meetings and NA meetings. And I get invited often when someone has an anniversary of sobriety and they want to celebrate, and there's always a cake. And you go, and people stand there, and they tell you that their lives were once in a mess until somebody told them about a place where they could get sober, where they could get straight, where they could get their lives back. And the people that met with me this week said what I've heard so many times from people who've been through 12-step programs, it saved my life. Oh, if we could learn evangelism like that that doesn't start out from a position of hierarchy and privilege and I'm in, you're out. If we could say to somebody, my life was a mess until Jesus Christ came. I was mired in sin and guilt and grief. I was just struggling to get by until somebody invited me to be part of a new life. That is what it means to be a light, not just to the nations, but to each other. We started reading a little bit today in the First Corinthians, and we're going to keep that up through the weeks leading up to Lent. Today was just the introduction, not much there, other than giving thanks to God for those who are part of the church. But trying to say to a church that was getting really hung up in spiritual gifts, my gifts are better than your gifts, to say, it's all of us together that make the church. And what I want you to do right now is something you probably might be a little uncomfortable with. I want you to turn to somebody in the pew and I hope it's not somebody you know, but even if it is, I want you to do this for real. I want you to take a moment and think about who it was who first told you the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that made you think, I want to know more. Think about that. You might need to get up and share it with somebody else, but do that right now. I want you to share who is the first person who ever really told you, not the, not the mom or dad or grandparents who dragged you to church, but the person who said to you, this is what God has done for me. This is what Christ has changed in my life. Take a moment and think of that, and I want you to share it with somebody. Oh, I'm serious.
Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook now. When's the last time you were invited to talk during a sermon? <laughs> now I want you to stop and I want you to close your eyes for just a moment and I want you to thank God for that person in your life. I want you to take a moment and think about what your life would have been like if no one bothered to tell you the good news of God and your Savior, Jesus Christ. What would your life be like without the fellowship of believers around you, without your family and faith, without the knowledge of God's love for you? What would your life be like without that? And then I think what's the hardest question of all? When's the last time you told anybody what God has done for you? When is the last time you shared the story of your salvation? Not that you get yourself saved, but the time in your life when you realize the depth of God's forgiving love and grace and peace that came into you because you understood that Jesus Christ loved you more than his own life that he was willing to give for your sake and the sake of the world. And if you can't think of the last time you share that with somebody, what I want you to do is think about the next time you will have the opportunity to share that with someone. Because there are so many people in the world without hope, without family, without love, who do not know what grace looks like or feels like, you have it in abundance. So this morning, what I want you to do is don't worry about being Peter. He ended up the first Pope of Rome. Don't strive for that. But for the love of God and your Savior, Jesus Christ, be like Andrew. Be like Andrew. Tell somebody. I have seen the Messiah, and he loves you just as he loved me. And then you will be a light to the nations. It will start right around you, but it will spread because that person will believe you because they know you and love you and trust you, and then they will believe, and then they will tell, and then they will tell and then they will tell. That's how the story gets told. I once was lost, but now I'm found. So be the beggar who tells another beggar where to find bread by telling how you found your Savior, or more accurately, how your Savior found you. Amen. <laughs>